Again, so spooky. <laughs> so. Um, before we dive in, well, first of all, uh, I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're visiting, you're a special guest, and we are glad that you're here. And if uh, this is your first time or first time in a long time, welcome. Welcome to FBC. I'd love to meet you after the service. I'll be out in the lobby and would love to uh, shake your hand. And so come on out there and... Uh, and find me, introduce yourself. Um, but before we dive in, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things, kind of our larger church family, a few things that you should know. Um, Dan Larson, a member of our church, passed away a few weeks ago, and his service is uh, today. Uh, it'll be in here this afternoon, and uh, he was a great, great man, been around here for a while, uh, great husband, uh, father, and uh, uh, I didn't really get to know Dan. Uh, all that well before he passed away. Uh, but I do understand that he and I have something in common, and that is a love for ice cream. And uh, if you knew Dan, then you knew about that love for ice cream. In fact, after the memorial service today, there's an ice cream fellowship afterwards. And so, Wendy, I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon, but that is a fantastic idea. And so, <laughs> I think I would like to have that. Um, that, that would be, or for others to have that. I mean, I would, I'm not, sorry. I'm, anyway. Um, and so, Noni, are you in here? Any of the family this morning? Noni, our uh, hearts. Had, hmm. Our hearts and prayers and thoughts are with you and your family. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and then also want to let you know, uh, Lee Capel, who is one of the founding Members of this church back in the 80s with three other families. He just suddenly and tragically passed away earlier this week as well. And so if you would remember the, the Capel family uh, in your uh, prayers, I believe they live in the Dallas area now. And he hasn't been here for a long time. Is that right? They moved away from here many years ago. But um, Lee had, a, I think, a surgery and sepsis. And so it was just very sudden. This wasn't anything that anybody... Um, you know, that knew about, I mean, it just happened. And so anyway, thoughts and prayers with the Capel family. I know several of you have been around here uh, for a long time, would know them and, um, and would want to know that information. I think we sent out uh, the information on that service too, through a prayer request or something. So anyway, wanted to make you aware of that. Um, we started a new series last Sunday titled The Church, Culture, and Politics. And uh, it's my hope, and by the way, thank you for in indulging me a little bit and not putting for sale signs in my front yard <laughs> after I was a little concerned. That happens in little, you know, Texas towns when the football coach stops winning, right? And you start, the high school football stops winning, and they put for sale signs in the coach's front yard. Pastors worry about those kinds of things, so thank you for indulging me a little bit. And, um, and, and so it's my hope and belief by addressing the issue of, of politics by talking about this as a church, as a faith family, as a community of faith, that uh, more of us can actually experience the peace that Jesus promised us in John 16 when he said, I told you these things so that in, in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I've conquered the world. And, and so I just desire for our church to be a, a safe place where we can engage in uh, the political process in a, in a way that I, I hope would be healthy um, and also be able to take heart and not lose our minds no matter who wins the election um, this November. Because right now, the odds of your candidate winning the election are about 50-50. That is, unless you live in Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. Um, Rabbit Hash, Kentucky is a very real place. And for the last several uh, years, uh, they have elected a dog as mayor of the city. In fact, it started um, in 1998. I think we have these names on the screen. Yep, here's, I'm going to go down a list of the mayors. In 1998, the first dog mayor was Goofy Borneman of unknown breed. It looks like Goofy died in office in 2000. 
and won because the next mayor that served was Junior Cochran, a black lab, who served from 2004 to 2008. After that, uh, we have Lucy Lou, the border collie, the uh, first and only two-term mayor in Rabbit Hash, served two terms, 2008 through 2016. That was followed by my personal favorite, Brenneth Paltrow, the pit bull, who served from 2016 to 2020. Uh, And then the dog so famous, he only goes by one name, Wilbur. The French bulldog was elected in 2020, uh, and so it's, it, we don't know who will run in 2024. Uh, Wilbur was only six months old when he took office, and so it's possible that he may be the second two-term mayor of Rabbit Hash. Uh, I tell you that to tell you this. There doesn't appear to be a lot of political tension in Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. <laughs> like everywhere else in the country right now. And so, listen, as we begin today, I want to say something very clearly. I recognize that there's a lot of tension wrapped up in talking about politics. And and as we step into this conversation today, uh, particularly the conversation, what we're going to talk about regarding what is our duty or what is our choice as an American citizen who votes and what's our duty, our response as a people who are already a part of um, this kingdom that's here and not yet, uh, or people who are interested in learning um, what it might be like to to try to view politics through a kingdom lens instead of a a political one. And so today, what I want to do is I want to prepare you for what you do before, during, and after the ballot booth this November, okay? That's where we're going today. So if you have your Bible, you can flip or turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, uh, and you can just put a finger there. We'll get there in just a minute, because one of the other things that I've wanted to do every single week is uh, bust a political myth, okay? I want to look at a political myth, so let's take a look at uh, the myth that we're busting today. Here's the political myth we're considering this morning. The Bible is always clear on how Christians should vote. Not true. Uh, I, I want you to see today that it's not that simple. It sounds good to say, sounds pretty easy to say, um, but I want to show you that if you're using a, a biblical filter for the way that you show up at the polls and vote, if you believe um, or if you're a person that believes it's as easy as just voicing your values, I don't think it's as simple as we make it out to be. I could give you Uh, a bunch of different examples. I'll just pick two this morning, and I want to walk you through this. These are probably two issues that you likely have an opinion on. One's immigration, and the other is charity. And by charity, what I mean is, what what do we do? What's our responsibility of taking care of the poor, okay? Immigration uh, and charity, two things, again, you probably have an opinion on. And I can just tell you, um, if you think the Bible's overtly clear on one side of this or the other, I don't think you're reading the same Bible I'm reading. Um, I don't think it's that simple because here's what the Bible says about immigration or immigrants. In Leviticus, it says, when an alien resides with you in your land, you must not oppress him. You will regard the alien who resides with you as the native born among you. Mm. You will welcome people from Mexico or Honduras or Cuba as one of you. As a citizen of the United States, you are to love him as yourself, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God speaking these words. And Romans says, let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. So there's clear scripture that says we're to protect and welcome the foreigner, and scripture that teaches us to obey the laws of the land, and currently, uh, there's a legal or illegal way that you can come into the country. Right? I mean, those are both in the Bible, And so I don't think it's as easy as we make it out to be. Or let's just take charity. 
I mean, there's so many scriptures that I could use about taking care of the poor. I'll just use 1 John 3. If anyone has the world's good, has the world's riches, has wealth, and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, or withholds your wealth, is essentially what it means, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. And then 2 Thessalonians says, if anyone isn't willing to work, he shouldn't eat. The scriptures clearly teach that we're obligated to give generously to the poor, and yet it says if you don't work, you don't eat. Those are in the same Bible that I'm reading. And so all I'm saying is this, it's not as simple as voting the Bible's values because you can often find scripture that will support your political view if you want to. There's a tension there, right? And so the big question I think we need to wrestle with is this, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this tension? And so I, I want to help you think through this this morning, and I'm just going to give you my two cents, and it's my sincere hope that this will serve you well uh, as you get ready to vote either in May at local elections or November the 5th. And here it is. Here's my instruction to you, my two cents. As a fellow believer, you should vote and. You should vote and. And so let me be clear by what I mean when I say vote and. Here's what I mean. Anytime you vote, you should vote your biblically informed conscience, okay? You should absolutely do that. You should vote your biblically informed conscience, and if you think your responsibility starts and ends um, doing your civic duty and just casting a vote, if you're a follower of Christ, you're sadly mistaken. It doesn't stop there. That's what I mean by vote and. See, too many of us think that we're doing our duty as Christians or our duty as uh, good Christian Americans is limited to the ballot box. And it's just not. There's a story where Jesus really walks us right into this example. It comes from the book of Matthew. So if you've already flipped to Matthew chapter 22, we'll begin in verse 15. Here's, Here's what it says. It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to trap him by what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Verse 18, perceiving their malicious intent, Jesus said, why are you testing me, hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. They brought him a denarius. Jesus says, whose image and inscription is this? And so he's holding up the coin, and you should just know that a denarius on one side would have had, just like our coins do, it had a, a, a picture of, of Caesar or the ruling authority at the time. And then uh, what was on the other side of the coin rotated a lot. Sometimes it was animals. Sometimes it was a god or a goddess. Uh, two people on a coin. That would be very confusing, wouldn't it? Which side's the right side? I don't know. Um, anyway, that, that, so, so they've got this coin, and we're just going to assume for a second there's maybe not a god or a goddess on the other side. Maybe there was. And so Jesus says, show me this coin. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them, Caesar's, they said to him. Then he said to them, give then to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Okay, what's happening in this story is there's two factions of Jewish people. You've got the Pharisees and the Herodians, both Jewish people. The Pharisees would be kind of like our modern-day fundamentalist Christians. I mean, they were all about the law. There were 613 Jewish laws, and they were all about abiding by those laws and not stepping out of bounds. I mean, super, super conservative. Then you had the Herodians, who were also Jews, but you can tell by their name uh, a little bit that they were for supporting Rome. King Herod. That's where Herodians comes from, 
right? So on, on one hand, you, you, you've got these people who are like, we don't want to have anything to do with Rome. That's the Pharisees. And then this other faction who's like, wait a minute, maybe we should uh, pay our respects to um, Herod and to Rome. I mean, you know, I don't know. So here's the deal. These two factions of Jewish people never came together. They're coming together, though, in this situation because they're trying to trap Jesus, and so they, I guess they've got a huddle up of the minds and they're like, uh, let's ask him a question. We're going to get, let's just, and let's make it a yes or no question. So, you know, he can't deflect. I mean, he's got to answer this, but let's ask him, right? And so they come together. They got this simple question, Jesus, yes or no, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Pretty simple. Now, if Jesus simply says, well, Caesar is king, Right? I mean, he's in authority, so he's the king. Of course, you should pay your taxes to Caesar. If Jesus just says that and he stops right there, then, then the Pharisees are like, look, I mean, we told you, he, there's no way this guy can be the Messiah. They, they would do anything they, they could do to try to discredit his ministry. On the other hand, if he says, no, you shouldn't pay Caesar, because there's a God that's greater than Caesar, if he only says that, if he stops right there, they would have said, this guy's an insurrectionist. He's against Rome. He doesn't support us. Off with his head. That's what they would have done. In either case, they're, they're, they would have tried to discredit and destroy his ministry, and so they're trying to catch Jesus in a trap, but Jesus is always the smartest one in the room. And so what does he do? He says, show me the coin. Show me the coin that's used to pay the tax. And Jesus, again, holding up this coin, probably with Caesar's head on one side of it, and his picture says, whose image is this that's on the coin? And they're like, Caesar's. And he's like, yes, of course. Okay. Pay it then to Caesar what Caesar's and to God what's God's. And so what's Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, absolutely, in this world, there are political governing authorities, and they are to be respected. I, I saw a pastor this week that said, you're responsible for paying taxes, just not how they're used. That is a difficult banner to live under as a Christian sometimes, isn't it? I'm called to pay the taxes, I don't always get input or get say on how those are used, how that money gets spent. And Jesus is saying, I think, there are spiritual authorities, and God is the highest of those authorities. So listen, we vote and because, yes, we give to Caesar what is Caesar's. We recognize the governing authority, but we attribute ultimate spiritual authority to God. That's why last week when we, um, we talked about that poll that was taken by More in Common that did the research, if you remember that, we talked about the extreme uh, sides that we currently see in our country um, from the left and, and to the right, from liberal to conservative, but there was that big chunk in the middle. Do you remember that? The 56% that were part of what the researchers called the radical middle or the exhausted majority. This is why I'm part of that. I'm part of that group. And some of you will say, well, that's a cop-out, and I'm telling you it's not, because it's way easier to pick a tribe. <laughs> I mean, you pick a tribe, people are on your side. It's just easy. It's like, uh, are you for the Astros or the Rangers? Both? No, sir. No, sir. Not here. You got to pick, right? And I'm like, yeah, but what about, I like them both. It's easier to pick a side, and here's why I can't pick a side, and this is just me talking, okay? I know some of you might not like this, but as a pastor, I am uh, I'm disturbed and frustrated by what, um, what, what, what I sense is an overt and implied racism and lack of compassion generally coming from Republican Party. And... Uh, equally uh, disturbed by the secularization and the undermining of Scripture that I see coming from the Democratic platform. And so I feel this tension of being torn. Maybe you also feel this way. 
just indulge me for a minute. Can you be a woman who supports women's rights and desires to see women treated equally in the workplace and be against abortion? Can you be a successful entrepreneur? Man, I am, I am a capitalist core. Uh, to the core, I am for free markets, and I care about the poor. Um, can you be really concerned about the overreach of government. Like, there's too much government. We don't need more politicians. We don't need more laws protecting in the, the environment. And yet, I want to protect the environment. Um, maybe you're asking, can I be a first-generation American who wants stronger borders and a clear immigration policy? Can you be all of those things? The answer is yes. Biblically, yes. Yes, we can. Like in the church, you ought to be able to stand in these different places and still be brothers and sisters in Christ. And so by all means, you should vote your biblically informed conscience and recognize that your conscience is never going to be perfect and it's never going to be 100% clear. But you can do that as long as you embrace the and. And so what is the and? Let me give you three practical ways to vote and. The first one is this. Vote and carry one another's burdens. Vote and carry one another's burdens. Galatians 6.2, Paul writes, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, there's a guy named Rufus Miles. And... Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands because you'd have to be pretty old to remember who Rufus Miles was. He ran the Bureau of the Budget in the 1940s. So just keep your hands down if you know Rufus. But he, for the United States, ran the Bureau of the Budget. And uh, he came up with this rule, with this law, and it says this. This is Miles' law. It's named after him. Where you stand depends on where you sit. Where you stand depends on where you sit. What he means politically is that one's position uh, in a bureaucracy determines one's position on an issue, right? I mean, we could say it this way. Our cultural context determines our perspectives in life. If you grew up middle class, when you go to the polls, you're going to have a middle class perspective. You can't help it. That's what you knew. If you grew up poor, you're going to have a poor perspective. If you grew up wealthy, you're, that's going to be your perspective. If you grew up African American, if you grew up Asian, that is your perspective. If you grew up in a family who is a, a, a one-lever Democrat or a one-lever Republican, you take that with you. I mean, regardless of how you grow up, where you stand is where you sit. And so, Let's not act like our political opinions were shaped in a vacuum because they weren't for any of us. We've got to understand and recognize that. But we have something working against us, and it's called the fundamental attribution error. Here's the definition. A cognitive bias that causes us to attribute another person's behavior to their character while attributing our behavior to social environmental factors. So let me give you an example. How many of you know that person who's always late? Okay, I see a few elbows. Husband and wives are like, hey, he's talking about you right now. Um, that person that's always late, man, it doesn't matter. It could be someone at the office. It could be someone in your family. They cannot get to the meeting on time. They cannot get out the door on time. They cannot get to the function on time. Everybody knows that person, right? You can think of somebody. And if you can't, you know what they say, right? <laughs> it's you. You're, you're that person. So here's the thing. When they're consistently late, what do you think about that person? What conclusions do you draw about them? I'll tell you what you do. You go, that is a lazy person. That is an inconsiderate person. That is a selfish person. They are only thinking about themselves. They do not respect my time or anyone else's time. Oh, man. 
Now, what do you think when you're late? I mean, we always have an excuse, right? Oh, I was, I was having a conversation in the office. It was with my boss, and I was trying to get here on time, but I just couldn't get out of that situation, man. I'm so sorry. I planned for the traffic. I even put like an extra 15 minutes in the calendar today, but wouldn't you know, I got stuck in an accident on the way here and just couldn't get here on time. See, when it's someone else, we, we say they have a problem, and then when it's you and me, we just make excuses. This is the fundamental attribution error. That's the exact same problem with our politics. You know what? The Republicans, they're all racist. Come on. We all know that. Right? Who are we kidding? Democrats, they're all attribution error. And here, here's the thing, it drives ad sales, it makes a lot of money for the parties, and it's terrible on relationships. This might sting, but mature, emotionally intelligent people don't fall for that. Shouldn't fall for that. I mean, we do, but we shouldn't. Christ followers are better than that. So don't buy into the lie that your brothers and sisters who vote differently from you are somehow evil or don't know Jesus. Think about what it would feel like and what we would show the world if we were able to vote and carry each other's burdens. The second way to vote is this, vote and get proximate to the problem. Let me tell you the one thing uh, I mean, there's several, but there's at least one that Washington, uh, D.C., uh, City Hall, uh, you name it, the state of Texas gets wrong every single election, uh, and that's this. They promise that if you'll vote for them, they'll fix that thing. They'll bring an end to whatever that issue is, right? I mean, just vote for me, and I'll just bring an end to it. It's going to be resolved if you vote for me, but I believe God wants more from us than just showing up at the ballot box. I think Micah 6.8, this is something, man, if you've grown up in church, you have heard this passage, this verse right here probably your whole life. Mankind, he has told each of you what's good and what it is the Lord requires of you, to act justly, to love mercy or faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. And so, listen, vote for the issues that you care about. But recognize that a kingdom person is not only called to vote, they're called to engage this broken world. I mean, how does that look again? Again, there's several issues that we could apply this to. I'm just going to pick a small one. How about abortion? Before I proceed, uh, let me be extremely clear uh, that the baby is a person in the womb. The fetus has a soul, period. Period. Psalm 139, for it was you, God, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and fearfully and wondrously made. Okay, there is no denying that. So if you're going to vote pro-life, if that is your thing, vote and take action. Vote and take action. Are you called to support foster families? Are you called to adopt? I mean, listen, I, uh, I, I'm 55, and I, I look at this, and I go, man, could I have another baby in the house? I don't know. A teenager? I've already raised two. M maybe that's not your calling, but are you called to support those who foster and adopt? I mean, we have a family in our church right now. Kim R. and our children's director was telling me this. We have a family in our church right now, beautiful family, have four kids of their own, like teenagers, like older, and have just recently adopted a younger one and are trying to adopt three more. That's pro-life. Um, how about this one? Are you for giving felons their rights back after they've been incarcerated so that they can get a job and take care of their families? 
That's pro-life. How a couple of weeks ago, uh, Joe and Heather Lane stood right here on the stage and talked about uh, uh, Young Life in an in a, in a offshoot ministry called Young Lives that's about supporting single moms. Is that your calling? Like, vote and take action. If you're going to vote social issues, it's fine. The word justice shows up over 450 times in Scripture. I mean, you can make a biblical case for for voting uh, justice. No question, right? But if you are going to vote primarily on social issues, vote and support the programs that don't just give a hand out but a hand up. Whatever the issue is for you, whatever things you're passionate about, ask yourself, what am I doing as a citizen to vote and do what God's calling me to do to not just cast my vote, but to get proximate to the issue and the problem. And then here's the final thing. Um, Vote and pledge allegiance to a king and a kingdom. At the end of the day, as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus, our hope does not rest on any political candidate. It doesn't rest in any political party. It doesn't rest in any political system. It doesn't rest in a country. It rests in a king and a kingdom who has inaugurated hope through his death, burial, and resurrection for everyone in the world. His name is Jesus. He is who we vote for. He is who we align with. That's the ultimate thing that we stand for. Like, what would it look like if Jesus was in charge of your neighborhood, your HOA? What would it look like if Jesus ran the city or the state, you know, or the country or the world? I mean, it definitely is our Christian hope that that we're marching toward a day when that's going to be true where everything is going to operate the way that the king desires it to operate. And so we should be people who participate now in the coming of that kingdom. There's a verse that has a phrase tied to it, and I just want to explain it to you because oftentimes I think the phrase is misused. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for the church. It's like the most beautiful chapter. And Jesus is praying for the church, and in verse 16, he says, he's praying to God, and he says, they, meaning you and me, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And so there's this phrase in this Christian subculture that's come from this, where we say, well, as followers of Jesus... Uh, we're in the world, but not of it, right? We've got t-shirts, we've got hats, we've got bumper stickers. And the problem is, is sometimes that phrase is used often to retreat from the world. And yet two verses later, Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you were in the world, You are not of the world, but you are absolutely called to engage the world. And and, and when is the church best equipped to engage the world? It's when we're one. It's when we're united. In fact, three verses later, Jesus would say this, God, may they all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world, listen, so that the world may believe you sent me. I mean, how can we be one? We can be one when we choose to put our faith filter in front of our political filter. when we choose not to be divided over the person who's going to sit in the Oval Office for the next four years and instead unite under the King of Kings who will reign forever. See, too many of us just don't, I think we just don't believe that. I think if you get up, caught up in politics here in, in, in this life on this planet, it's that you don't believe that he's the King of Kings. And that he's the Lord of lords. 
and you don't believe that he's ultimately in charge. So we choose to give each other grace. We choose to keep talking about the tough issues. And at the end of the day, we choose above all else to be together, to be one. And so my prayer um, is that our church would be a church that embraces the and. A church that believes you don't have to check your brain or your political affiliations at the door. And that we would be a people who would elevate our unity and Jesus above our partisan politics. And that we would be about the business of bringing the kingdom of Jesus right here in Longview as it is in heaven. I, I want to end with a, a quote. I came across this this week. Um, a pastor that I've met before down in the Houston area, a guy named Jason Shepard. He said this, change will not happen primarily through legislation or organizations. Though, of course, we still pursue these things like voting. We still pursue these things as leverage for all of the good that they can bring. Change will primarily happen when the human heart changes, and the change of the heart is the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is done through the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of the scriptures and the discipleship of one another to live out the life of Christ, which is loving God with all of our being and loving our neighbor as ourself. And then he concludes by saying, this happens through the body of believers, the church. So the church preaching the gospel, teaching the scriptures, making disciples is the epicenter of change. Jesus is the most powerful force of change. And so church, I just, I pray that you go into this week remembering what Jesus has done for you so that you have hope and know that you are united with believers from all over the globe, generation after generation, all because of what Jesus has done. And as you consider the ballot box this May or November, at any point in the future, that you will vote and. That you will vote and. That you will vote your biblically informed conscience, realizing that it's not always clear, it's not always perfect, but that we would carry one another's burdens, that we would get proximate to the problem, and that we would pledge allegiance ultimately to the King and his kingdom. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we um, are just confronted with your word this morning. And, and God, we live um, in a time where, um, man, politicians just seem to want us divided. And as Christ followers, we have allowed that division into the church. It's our responsibility to keep it out. And so, God, in this moment, if there's those of us here that need to repent for it being part of the problem and not the solution, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would convict us, that you would convict those of us of us in this room that, that have put our political filter ahead of our faith filter. And maybe we're here and we need to repent because we've been disengaged. Because we just want to avoid the conflict and we want to avoid the hard conversations. And we just don't feel like we have the answers, and so it's just caused us maybe a little apathy. And so maybe we need to repent from that as well. Either way, God, uh, this morning we pledge allegiance to you. You're our king. Help us be part of bringing uh, your kingdom here on earth. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Um, next week, as we continue the series, um, we'll, we'll have a couple of more weeks left. Next week, I'm going to try to help us understand the main reason that talking about politics is so difficult. The reason it's so difficult is because we always disagree. <laughs> And I think we're always going to disagree, and so we're going to talk about why uh, there's always going to be disagreement. So anyway, I hope you'll come back next week. Uh, If you're here this morning and you would like to pray, maybe um, this week's events, uh, something's happened this week uh, to you personally or your family, Um, maybe you just need some time by yourself and you want to just come down here to the altar. When we dismiss in a In a minute here, some of our prayer team members will be down front here to meet you and to pray with you. Or again, if you're just like, no thanks, and just want to grab some solo time at the altar, uh, we welcome that uh, as well. And so would you stand as we read our benediction uh, together? We'll be here on the screen behind me. As God has forgiven our sins, let us go joyfully into God's world offering God's love, forgiveness, and peace. Go in peace, and the peace of God goes with you. Amen. You're dismissed.